Uh, good morning. May I speak to Elizabeth Blackburn, please? Uh, this is she speaking. Oh, hello. It's Adam Smith calling from the Nobel Foundation website. Oh, yes. Yes, I was told to expect your call. Oh, how nice. <laughs> um, thank you. And, well, congratulations. Thank um, you. Uh, it's terrifically early in the morning where you are. I, uh, I don't, guess. don't even <laughs> tell me how early it is. <laughs> <laughs> had, had, had you managed to go to bed before they woke you up with a call? Well, I had, yes. <laughs> the night was definitely truncated, <laughs> in a good way. Indeed. I've um, just spoken to um, Carol Grader and Jack Shostak, and, and, yes. and, and uh, to them I asked the same thing. But y you presumably had a suspicion that this was on the way, given the number of prizes that have been coming your way recently. Well, uh, there, was, there had been some press speculation, which I had, which I had tried to ignore, but... Um, but believe me, it still was a very great surprise. <laughs> now, um, the prize um, has been awarded for research work you did mainly during the early 80s. Uh, right. Um, but, you, but you've devoted your whole life to telomeres. So I wanted to ask, what, what was their particular fascination for you? Well, so many aspects. First of all, just how, how does it work? Why... Why are telomeres working the way they do? And every time we looked with an experiment, we would find something ever more complicated and clever that the cell did. And and we you know realized you know the old truism from the original cytogenetics, which was that the telomere is, is really important for protecting ends. And and as you might expect, the cell actually devotes all sorts of machinery to make sure that never goes wrong, or goes wrong as little as possible. And so that intricacy of the machinery is just a, a marvelous thing. Mm. And then in recent years, it's become very interesting to look at what happens to telomeres in humans, because yes. they really do um, seem to reflect uh, you know, our status of health and uh, risk of disease in, in quite a striking way that suggests that what one sees at telomeres gets integrated uh, you know, from a lot of different inputs, but it really serves as a, as a kind of uh, an indicator of how well cells are doing. So, so it's just been endlessly fascinating because the, the science of it is endlessly fascinating. I, I want to turn to humans in a, a second, but the, the original observations you just mentioned about the protective role of telomeres was were made in the 30s by Muller and McClintock, for instance. That's right, absolutely. And, and we always have to remember that they worked from you know, the deduction of genetics and cytogenetics with no knowledge that even the genetic material was DNA. And so, um, so, so, so you know, what my work had been doing was to, first of all, show the molecular nature of the telomeric DNA itself. And then with Jack Shostak, we you know were able to extend that and show that something strange was going on. <laughs> and uh, and then with Carol, that was when uh, we worked together to hunt for this enzyme that we or activity we suspected existed, which was telomerase. So that put put the cytogenetic observations onto the molecular footing. Mm. You know, before the telomere had sort of been the blob at the end of the chromosome. Well, exactly. I mean, it had sort of lain there for decades, um, if you like, known about, thought about, but nobody was particularly able to, 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 to tease apart its, its function. Right. Like, like so many things in science, it depended on, first of all, understanding what was the nature of the chromosome, which was DNA as well as proteins, and then, and, you know, and then... Thinking about, uh, as, as Kornberg did, thinking about how DNA is replicated, not only thinking, he showed, mm -hmm. and then that showed that there were problems with replication at the ends of chromosomes. And so that was, you know, one of the big impetuses for looking for uh, telomerase, which is to try to see how the cells answer the question of how their incomplete replication problem gets solved. Mm. And, and in your sort of journey through, through through telomeres, how much has been dependent on finding the right companions to work with? Because, for instance, you met Jack Shostak at, at a Gordon conference in 1980, or at least you decided to collaborate right, there. Right. Well, I think that's the way all science happens, right? And, um, and I suppose there's an element of, you know, you know chance favours the prepared mind too, right? Mm. So that's, but that's the way science happens. It, it's a lot of... Um, meetings of minds and 
and you know the concepts of telomere, uh, telomeric DNA and the sequencing. Well, that was very dependent on the sequencing methodologies that were being worked out um, even before the uh, you know now conventional methods of DNA sequencing mm. happened. We didn't use those. We you know I, I was using very unconventional methods to sequence the telomeric DNA originally. And methods devised by, for example, my husband, John Sadat, and, right. <laughs> and Ed Ziff, you know, yes. while we were in Cambridge in England. That's right, because you were postdocs together with Fred Sanger, is that? I was a, a graduate student with Fred Sanger, and, and John Sadat, was my, uh, who's now my, who's my husband, yeah. <laughs> he, he, now, um, yeah. he was a postdoc. Yeah. And so, so, you know, everything built on uh, other technologies. So, you know, I was building on, you know, I was curious about the ends of, ends of um, you know, chromosomes and... Uh, and building on technologies completely, which were m- methods of sequencing DNA, and people like uh, Ray Wu and the Murrays in Edinburgh, you know, th- all these people had been figuring out ways to sequence the very ends of chromosomes. Mm. So, so it's a tremendous sort of interactive process, as I'm sure you, you know, <laughs> have heard a thousand times. But it's nice to have it. It's nice to hear it described. Um, your current work um, is, as you said, focused on humans, and in particular on the relationship between chronic, chronic stress and... That's something, yes, we're very interested in that. Well, that, that's a corner of my lab. You know, we have part of our lab where we interact with um, uh, colleagues, uh, clinical colleagues, and, and one in particular at my institution, Alyssa Ethel, who was the person who first started to ask with us this question of chronic stress and how was it related to telomere maintenance. And, uh, and no, like, actually, we still do a lot of very basic research. Mm-hmm. You know, we're still fascinated by those same questions you addressed earlier. Mm-hmm. You know, how, you know, what is it that keeps you interested in the telomere? There's, it's so intricate and complicated, and you want to know how it works. So, actually, most of my lab does the very basic research. The chronic stress part is, to me, just fascinating, though. Mm-hmm. Because uh, it really relates to, you know, what a lot of humanity undergoes. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, is it the case that um, telomere length and maintenance is co- is affected directly by stress, and is that perhaps causative of problems that uh, then arise from stress, or is it some kind of epiphenomenon? There's, there's two parts to the question. So one is, so, so the association of telomere shortness and actually even, you know, poorly regulated telomerase, we're finding, that association and chronic stress is, is very real. And there are certain situations where our studies, uh, and Lisa Apple has looked at cohorts of women who are de- caregivers of a chronically ill child, and more recently even dementia caregivers, uh, where the dementia patient is their husband or um, partner. What they find is, oh, what, we, what we find is that it really does look causative, particularly in one study, the number of years that a mother had been in her situation was related to the extra telomere shortness and the dampening of telomerase. Mm. And that made me, you know, and us really think this is likely to be causative. Mm -hmm. Because the number of years relating to those parameters, it's very, a number of years the person was in the stressful situation relating to those parameters being, you know, worse, it's very hard to imagine a scenario where it would work the other way around, <laughs> mm-hmm. that the shortness of the telomeres and the dampened telomerase was causing that mother to have been in that situation one year, five years, 12 years. You know, it doesn't, doesn't logically follow. <laughs> yes. So yes. that kind of evidence uh, makes us think there's a causality. Now, the question is, does that cause the uh, bad um, clinical effects of stress, which have been you know, well documented in the literature for years and years? D- does the telomere shortening cause it? It's a plausible model, actually. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I'm inclined to think it does. But you have to be very careful about, you know, what exactly is the complete mechanism by which these adverse effects of stress are mediated. But certainly we see the effects on telomere maintenance in the immune system, which is turns out a very good window into what's happening in terms of disease risks in the body. Mm. So we do think that 
there's a, there's a lot of good reason to think that it might actually be a causative chain. Uh, so, and and your window onto the immune system in that case is is studying white blood cells. Is that correct? That's the ones that um, participants in studies give you, and uh, and we you know we now look at many many different cohorts of various kinds, um, uh, and and generally we try to have it in a situation where the person is healthy, so you're not confounded by disease. So that means that healthy individuals, you know, are donating their blood samples for the studies. Mm. So blood is one of the, you know, tissues one can look at. Right. One of the cell types, sorry, <laughs> one can look at. Right. I just wanted to ask you one last thing, which was that um, it's been commented previously that telomerase and, and telomere research is a field which is a, a happily a, a large number of women working in it. it is that? Do you agree with that? And is is that something that? Well, uh, well, yes, and and I'll turn I'll turn your comment around and say it's it's fairly close to the biological ratio of men and women. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the other fields that are aberrant. Absolutely, yes, yes. <laughs> so this is the no, this is the normal field, <laughs> right? Yeah, it, because because it is a much you know a much more even um, distribution between men and women. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And is that no, so? No, I can't compare with other fields. You know, this is the one I know. Right? Yes, but it is true. But is it something that you think you, you have actively worked at promoting to make it like that? You know, I've only actively promoted the good, what we always hope is good science, mm. and and uh, and then you know, it's not as if one would favour you know a woman researcher in the area over a man researcher in the area, but but you know, women have come into this field. Perhaps because, you know, in the molecular days of the field, that is the kind of things that I've been doing, and you know, that Carol and you know, we, that we were women, and then we, you know, tended to have women students and postdocs, which is not not a hundred percent. I mean, they tended to be fifty-fifty men and women, which is already a little higher than the usual ratios, um, and so you know, there's a sort of self-perpetuating aspect to that. Because there's nothing particularly about the science per se, which has any sort of gender-like quality to it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I, th I think we're looking very much at sort of sociological phenomena here. Yes, uh, but one might hope that since it seemed to be possible in this field, it could be possible in all fields. Yes. You really do hope that that when people see something like this working, that this could be seen. As I said, that this would be seen. You know, that this would be the norm. Mm. And you know the different ratios of men and women researchers in other fields would be the aberrancy. That's what I'd like to see. <laughs> you know, because you know you want women to have access to to science because it's such a wonderful thing to do. You know, it, it's and so anything that makes it more more feasible for women to be in science and doing the science they like, that's that's good. Well, thank you. That's a good note to stop on for now. I thank you very much for giving us your time. When you come to Stockholm in December, um, then happily we have the chance to interview you at greater length. Great, and I'll, hopefully I'll be a little less, just a little less uh, sleepy. <laughs> just, do, you plan, do you plan to try and return to sleep tonight, or is it is the day the, the day beginning? Hmm. I, I, well, I've made a couple of calls to the family, and I might try and get a little right now. That might be a good idea. Okay. <laughs> it good is, luck. after all, three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck with it. Nice to talk to you. Thank you bye very bye. much indeed. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.